What would you say is the real issue of Watergate? Not uh, Sam Irvin's eyebrows, anyway. But what would you say was the real issue of Watergate? Is it the presidency? Is that the real issue? Whether Nixon remains president or not? Is it the very continued existence of a two-party system? Is it the Constitution? Is it the moral life of the country that is the real issue? What would you say was the real issue? Why would you say that we are so concerned that Ehrlichman can be on nationwide TV and defend and justify the right to burglary. What makes us concerned about that? What makes us concerned about Buchanan trying to justify the political dirty tricks? Well, I think most of us would say immediately, well, because from our very early days we were taught that these were things that you ought to be ashamed of. Uh, things like burglary and things like deceiving people and lying to people. Well, is that the real issue of Watergate then? That men have started to do shameful things in politics. Well, I think all of us here in the theatre would say, no, they've always been doing shameful things in politics. That's n no change from what has always been the situation. Well, then, why are we concerned? Is it not, brothers and sisters, because these men, whom we respected, and whom at least our elected officials felt were responsible men, and were men worthy of respect, these men who were in the most influential and respected positions in our nation, not only did things that were wrong, but they admit that they did them so blatantly and so bluntly that they suggest that these are things that are no longer to be ashamed of. Is that not what kind of gets us all of it? It's not that these things have been done for the first time, but it's that they admit them so blatantly and bluntly and the attempt to justify them so clearly and in such exaggerated terms that the suggestion underlies it all that these are things that now we need no longer be ashamed of. Is it not that that concerns us? Is it not true that deep down in our hearts, even the most amoral among us this morning, deep down in our hearts, we feel that shame is not altogether a bad thing. This, if you want to take them out too, yeah, really. That shame is not altogether a bad thing. In fact, that shame might be a very healthy thing. We have a kind of feeling that shame can be a guide to us. That just as, you know, you go near to a fire and you feel the burning of the fire, that somehow keeps you out of the fire and at least, at least keeps your body safe, we kind of have a feeling that shame does the same kind of thing. Shame may well be keeping us from some dire consequences that would follow on a certain line of action, and therefore we feel shame is a kind of a good thing, even though when we've experienced it ourselves, we've been most uncomfortable about it. For instance, all of us know the real problem with leprosy. The real problem with leprosy is not actually the leprosy itself, but it's that a person loses the sense of touch in their extremities, their physical extremities. And so they can put their finger into a flame if they have leprosy and they don't feel anything. And actually what destroys a leper is not so much the disease itself, 
but the injuries that are done to his own body because he has lost the sense of feel. And is it not true that we're uh, just a little concerned about that in regard to shame? Uh, the, the, this book always does far better, you know, with truths about life than we do. Things that we just vaguely suspect, this book seems to put very, very clearly. And it capsulizes that principle there, if you look at it. It's Romans 6 and 21. Romans 6 and 21. And it's about page 981. 981. Romans 6 and verse 21. But then, what return did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. And God puts it pretty clearly, you know. He says, look, the things that you're ashamed of, the end of those things is death. In other words, shameful things bring death. Shame is a good thing. It's a good guide to you. Because shameful living brings death eventually. And so you should watch it. That's why I think many of us feel that Hunt's appearance, even though it's just a shame, you know, what so many of the underlings have suffered while the, so many who planned it uh, seem to be getting away free. It's why Hunt's appearance, haggard from jail, his wife dead in a plane crash, uh, his own life utterly destroyed as far as future is concerned, why Hunt's appearance actually reinforces reality and strangely enough does more for the nation and the constitution than the blustering and the bombastic performance of a man like Ehrlichman. Because somehow you begin to see, you know, yeah, well there, shameful living does bring death. Yeah, your sins do find you out. Yeah, there are certain absolutes that if you ignore them will destroy you eventually. That's why, for instance, uh, old westerns actually do more for true reality than many of their modern counterparts. Even though westerns fantasize like mad about the old west, yet they repeatedly bring home the truth that you can tell the difference between good and bad, and that good pays off and bad doesn't pay off, or that shameful living brings death. Who are the good guys? The boys with the black hats. No problem. They're not the fillers that were supposed to be good and weren't really good. They're the boys with the black hats. Who rides off into the sunset with the girl? We all know. The good guy, you know. So, old, so the old westerns really do a lot for this principle that Shame actually does act as a guide to what is destroying us. That's why the old late night movies on TV do more for the teaching of absolutes and morality than many of the modern so-called realistic existential movies. Because the old late night movies always show that the honest, unselfish underdog comes out right in the end. And the one who is evil suffers for his evil. And really, brothers and sisters, I think that's why many of us are just more than a little concerned about the whole of the Watergate uh, mess. Because we feel it's somehow suggesting that this principle does not operate, that shameful living brings death. I think, of course, some of us here today would say, yeah, but brother, isn't it true that that principle is often contradicted? Isn't that the real problem? Many of us think the Haldemans and Ehrlichmans will continue to live in their massive houses, while the poor little civil servant who has been loyal over the years will continue to pay heavier and heavier taxes, and they'll continue to get off scot-free. I think many of us would say that's the very problem. The mafia live in wealth while the poor little businessman who has to pay his extortion money month after month simply grinds a living out of the ground. Is it not true that this principle does not obtain any longer? Is it not true that often living that is regarded as shameful living actually seems to bring success and prosperity? 
Now, you know that that problem was dealt with, oh, maybe 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago in one of the oldest books uh, in the Bible. Uh, it's the book of Job. And uh, maybe you'd look at it there, Job 21. It's page 448, 448. Job 21 and verse 7. Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? Why does that happen? Why does it appear that the wicked do live and reach old age and grow mighty in power if shameful living brings death? Their children are established in their presence and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and no rod of God is upon them. And God answered that problem in the book of Job and Jesus answered it in the New Testament. The answer was this, that it appears to pay off that at times they're able to gain superficial material benefits that don't actually give them any satisfaction deep down. At times they're able to gain some kind of superficial respect from people whom actu who actually don't respect them and whom they cannot actually trust. At times they seem to get some temporary emotional exhilaration, but it is superficial and it is not a deep satisfaction deep down that is real. And in fact, shameful living still does bring death inside and eventually death outside. In fact, uh, John pointed out that the whole world is in the power of the evil one and that there is a power of evil that tries to manipulate circumstances so that wicked people appear to be gaining. But in fact, he cannot provide them with a deep satisfaction such as the creator of the world gives when we talk about real life. And that shameful living itself actually does bring death. Now maybe we should go on to that, the obvious question that you'd ask at that statement. All right, in what sense does it bring death? If they can get temporary superficial benefits, if they can get temporary respect from their peers, if they can get temporary emotional exhilaration, then in what sense does shameful living bring death? Maybe it's good to define both the terms that we're using. What is shameful living? Is shameful living immoral living? Is shameful living unconventional living? Is shameful living doing things that aren't nice? Well, I think... Society has tried to make the whole deal very dull by defining those things as shameful living. Uh, those aren't necessarily shameful living, though some of them may be. Shameful living, brothers and sisters, you can see what it is if you look back to where the verse occurs in Romans. Romans 6 and verse 21. Romans 6 and 21. It's page nine, 981. Verse 21, But then what return did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. Now, uh, what, of, which, of what are you ashamed? Well, it's in the previous verse. Verse 20, When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. When you were slaves of sin, you did things of which you were ashamed. So, Shameful living or shameful acts and thoughts and words come from being a slave of sin. Now, what is sin? Well, if you look at Romans 1 and 21, you'll see it defined clearly. Romans 1 and 21. Page 977. Romans 1 and 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senses' minds were darkened. Shameful living is sin. And sin is living as if there's no God. That's it. 
Shameful living is living as if you have to get whatever you want, enjoy whatever you desire, and manipulate whomever you please, because there is nobody to look after you but yourself. That's shameful living. And brothers and sisters, every time you live with that attitude deep down, God has planned that there will come into you a sense of shame. He's so good to us, you know. Even when we're wheeling against him like mad, he still puts certain guides inside us that will let us know, look, you're on the wrong track. You're moving towards death. And whenever you live as if there's no loving father to think of you at all, whenever you live as if you ought to get whatever you want, whatever anybody else thinks, and certainly whatever he thinks, when you live as if you have to grab all the emotional excitement and satisfaction you can get because he won't provide it for you, when you live as if you have to manipulate and dominate everybody else in order to stay alive and at the top of the heap, in other words, if you live as if there is no loving father, who knows everything that happens to you and takes care of you, then a sense of shame comes into you. And that sense of shame is good because it lets you know that you're moving towards death. Now, what is death? Well, the dictionary defines it as the cessation of life. And what is life? The dictionary defines life as interaction with your environment. So, death is the cessation of a full interaction with your environment. And the most real environment in which we live here in this world is the environment that was created by the supernatural power of life that God put around the earth. That is, there's a life of the Holy Spirit that is the only life that makes any light. There'd be no sunlight if the Holy Spirit was not there to keep the sun in the position it's in. There would be no winds if the Holy Spirit was not there sustaining the whole operation. There is a power, an invisible power, that keeps the world in the, perp in the place and gravity that it is. There is a Holy Spirit that gives the ability to smile, that gives the ability to laugh, that gives the ability for eyes to light up. If there were no Holy Spirit, none of that would take place. Now, death is the cessation of interaction between you and this life of the supernatural power of God. And once you cease to interact with that life of the Holy Spirit, your minds begin to be impaired through its lack, your emotions begin to be unbalanced, your bodies begin to become weakened. And as well as that, your sense of shame begins to alienate you from other people. So you begin to find yourself pushed off from others. You no longer have that open relationship with other friends that you had before. When you do something that brings shame. And then eventually you know that it works to put you into a life of darkness and loneliness in the ultra, supraspatial, supra time life that will go on after this world ends. And so it separates you finally from any source of life forever. That's what death is. It's an immediate experience that you have through the limiting of your own psychological being. It's an immediate experience you have of a break in relationship between yourself and other people. And it's a final experience of separation from the creator of life himself. And so forever you live in darkness and loneliness. Now that's what we mean, dear ones, when we say that shameful living brings death. Could we take just two instances of it so that you see it in, in particular terms? God was good in giving Judas that sense of shame when he decided to betray his friend. Now, you can see it if you look at it in John 13, it is, and verses 26 through 30. John 13 and verses 26 through 30. And immediately Judas set out toward death. God gave him this sense of shame as a warning that he was beginning this great journey into death in his own experience. John 13, 26. Jesus answered, you remember he was trying to explain that one of them would betray him. They said, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give this morsel when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas which was Judas' first warning, the son of Simon Iscariot. 
Then after the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. So obviously the morsel was not given in such an obvious way that they had all seen it. Some thought that because Judas had the money box, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, so that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he immediately went out, and it was night. And old Judas, you know, felt immediately, boy, I have to get out of this. I can't stay with this man. He knows what I'm going to do. I can't stay. And the shame drove him out into the night, and you know, the night so often in the New Testament means darkness and loneliness, because that's what night so often is where there is no light. And Judas was driven into separation, you know, on his own. And shame drove him into that. And the purpose of it was to try to keep him, to try to keep him from going further into death. In fact, he went further, and you remember the result in Matthew 27. Matthew 27, and 3 through 5. Page 863, 863, Matthew 27 and verse 3. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that he was condemned, he repented and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. So that's a very obvious proof, you know, of the truth. Here's the way it operates in you and me in regard to betrayal of friends. You have a roommate who isn't perfect because no roommate is. Who knows, you might not even be perfect yourself. So you have a roommate and you have a real friendship with the roommate. You're not terribly close, but you have a friendship. And you're sharing some things together that you really need. So you're a real benefit to each other, however close you are. You get together with another person who is equally close to you. And that person says something about your roommate. And you, because you want as much respect from as great a number of people as possible... And you can gain that through having many, many confidences with people. And mind you, that comes because you really don't feel that the creator of the universe is the only confidence and the only approval that you need. And that's why you do this kind of thing. So really, because you live as if there is no loving father who thinks the world of you, and therefore what does it matter what anybody else thinks of you, because you don't believe that, at that moment, even though you don't think it out and make it explicit, you join in. You say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, his socks do smell. They really do. You know. Or, yeah, he really does talk loud. Or, yeah, she doesn't dress very well. And you say something about the roommate with this other person. And you know fine well that immediately you do that, there is a little tiny sense of shame. I mean, there is a wee feeling inside you, well, I, I'm not really being honest here. If this other person were here, if my roommate was here, I wouldn't say these things. I just would be too ashamed and embarrassed to say them in front of them like this. And there does come a little sense of shame. And that kind of guides you that you're moving into death. And then you know what it's like when you go back to the roommate. Uh, Wordsworth has a, you know, poignant uh, line in a poem, There hath passed away a glory from the earth. And it's strange doesn't matter how shallow or superficial the relationship with the roommate is. Yeah, when you go back to them after talking about them, they have passed away a glory from you. It's not just the same as it was. Oh, maybe they're open with you, but you know what's in your heart. You, You know you talked about them behind their back. And the beginnings of separation begin to come between you. And there just isn't that open relationship. There isn't the enjoyment, even on a superficial level, the enjoyment of open love, the feeling that you're absolutely honest with each other as far as you've gone in your relationship. Now that's death, loved ones. That's the separation of death beginning to set in. And that's what happens. That's how it operates. And actually, if you continue to behave that way, you eventually behave that way with other people in regard to God. And so you actually separate yourself from him. You separate yourself actually from the Holy Spirit. The reason you can't love the roommate 
the way you used to is because you've turned yourself off from the Holy Spirit and there is not the love of the Holy Spirit pouring through you to the roommate. That's it. That's why you're always in trouble, you know, when you say, oh, I just have to psych myself into it again. I'm sure I can love them. Ah, hello, hello. And you give them a big hello and there's just nothing, you know. It's because you've cut yourself off from the Holy Spirit in regard to that relationship and so there isn't love coming out from you to that other person. Same with parents. Same with anyone, loved ones, that you break a confidence with. You are actually moving into death and the shame is a warning to you that that has happened. Let's take the other example, almost at the other end of the scale, though actually it's the same problem in a deep way. It's uh, in 1 Corinthians, if you look at it. 1 Corinthians 5. And verses 1 and 2. And Paul is dealing with some problems that the Corinthian church was having. And uh, this is one of the more obvious ones. It's page 993 and 1 Corinthians 5 and verses 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you and of a kind that is not found even among pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And Paul reinforces the whole sense of shame in regard to this piece of sexual promiscuity and incest. He reinforces this sense of shame. Now, why does he do it? Well, the next few verses show you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul delivered the man to Satan in the sense that he disciplined him out of the church. He said, get get him out of the church. It must be brought home to him that the shame that he presumably felt at the beginning of the relationship actually does show that he's on dangerous ground. And to emphasize that, to emphasize so that he does not become deceived and think that a child of God can live that way, get him out of the church. And get him out for one purpose. Not because we can't do anything about him, but because this will bring home to him that he's living in the midst of his own flesh. Not his body. Not sexual sin. But living in the flesh is living as if you cannot get the emotional exhilaration and satisfaction from God that you need. And therefore you go to anybody for it. You'll go to sexual intercourse for it. You'll go to some kind of incestuous relationship for it. Because you do not really believe, nor do you experience, the emotional satisfaction of a real relationship with your maker. And you just don't believe that you can get all from him that you need. Nor do you believe that he is giving you all that you need and you want more. And that's the release and you go into this kind of relationship. So Paul said to destroy the flesh, to destroy that independent attitude to your right to emotional satisfaction, discipline the man right out of the church because only this way, only by reinforcing the sense of shame have we any chance of doing anything with him or for him. And of course that's what happened. That was the result of it. If you look at the second letter of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, and verses 6 through 11. 2 Corinthians 2 and verses 6 through 11. And it's page 1005. Because obviously the man came into a spirit of penitence and repentance. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him. Or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So, obviously, if he needed comfort, he he at last came into repentance. So, I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. But this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. And one whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, to keep Satan from gaining the advantage over us. For we are not ignorant of his designs. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the purpose of shame. Good shame. Not the imaginary shame that society produces, but there is a good, healthy sense of shame. 
that is there to keep us from falling into death without knowing it. The man here this morning who is living with a woman outside marriage had a sense of shame the first time they ever had intercourse. You remember, it's so often described in books, uh, if some of you have not unfortunately experienced it. The sense of shame comes upon you and you're forced to say, I love you, after the act, you know, to try to kind of make yourselves feel that, well, it was all right. I mean, there's love in it anyway. But the sense of shame that that man first felt was from God and was a good gift of God. To guide him to the truth that he was moving toward death. That he was demanding some kind of emotional and physical exhilaration and satisfaction that God did not feel he had to have at that moment and that he did not actually have to have. And that God was well able to provide him this emotional satisfaction and exhilaration inside the bounds of his own will. And that man felt that sense of shame. If there's a girl here who has at any time had intercourse with someone or closeness to someone, outside the bounds of marriage. You know, the first time it happened, there was shame. Now, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you is, the shame is a good gift of God. It's a good gift of God. It's right. It is not foolishness. That old shame that your parents feel because you're living with someone outside the marriage bond, it's not old Victorian goody-goodness. It is not uh, old-fashioned inhibitions. That shame is not the middle-class morality of the bourgeoisie. It is not. That shame is a dear gift of God, which is as useful to you as the feeling of burning is when you put your hand near a fire. It's a good guide to you that the Creator is giving you Brother, sister, you're moving towards death and if you keep going this way, you'll eventually lose the sense of touch like the leper until you have no sense of shame and you'll go into death without knowing it. Now, brothers and sisters, that's really what I think God wants to share with us this morning. That shameful living does bring death. And shame is a good thing. If you say to me, you know, the shame that society gives, the shame that you're breaking society's conventions, no, no, not that at all. The shame that you're doing something that's very badly bad and that people like you wouldn't do, no, no. But the shame that God gives, the shame that he gives that you're beginning to live independent of him and demand things that he does not want you to have at that moment. Loved ones, if you don't respond to that shame, you'll move more and more into death in your own life. So, dear ones, would you... uh, I don't want you to get neurotic about afraid to do everything, but do you see that there is in each one of us a good, healthy thing called shame? And it's a good guide. I'm with you. If you say to me, Brother, uh, aren't there a hundred false senses of guilt that we have? Yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about those. There are plenty of false senses of guilt. But there's a shame that comes when you disobey the lines that God has laid down for our lives. You know, if you want to check, is it a false sense of shame? Just look up the book. That's it. Just look up the book. If you feel a a terrible shame that you've washed your hands five times that day, look up the book and see, is it wrong to wash my hands five times? It's not. Okay, so that's a false sense of shame. But if you have a sense of shame after sexual promiscuity, if you have a sense of shame after unclean thoughts, then look up the book. Does it say if you uh, have unclean thoughts in your mind, then you're disobeying God and you're living independent of him? Yes, it does. If you have a sense of shame over the way you're dealing with your money, look up the book. Okay. Am I giving a tenth of it to him? Uh, Am I not? All right. That's shame. But look, ones, God is good. You know, He's so good to us. Even when we're moving away from him and away from warmth and life and light and we're moving into our own solar system of darkness and loneliness and coldness, even then God is giving us that gift of shame inside to let us know. So it's really good, you know. So I'm all with you. Let's keep away from middle class morality and all that stuff. But let's see that there is a good shame that guides us about what brings death and what brings life.
I pray, you know, that this quarter, that really we'll live free from shame, you know. Just live free from shame. Whether it's the roommate and betraying them, or whether it's the sexual business and destroying our own bodies, that we'll live free from shame. There's a good place to live. Way in the light, you know, above the tree line. Above the tree line. Above the shadows and the shades and the darkness. There's a good place where you can live in real peace and real happiness. Dear Father, we thank you that you don't leave us in vague uncertainties about life and death. So, Father, we thank you for these feelings that we've had at times. And, Father, we want to nourish these feelings inside us. We don't want to become insensitive like a leper. Father, we don't want that moral leprosy that brings us into absolute death. Father, we trust you that by your Holy Spirit, You will show each of us that there is a healthy shame that is a good gift from you and that tells us which way we should move. We trust you, our Father, for any brother or sister here this morning who has sensed that shame. Trust you, Father, for good grace and strength for them to get up on their two feet and walk the right way towards life and light and you for your glory. Amen.